So we are still in Mark 10. I think we'll finish Mark 10 today. Yay! Um, and it's it's good because then next week we can really turn toward Jerusalem um, and the beginning of the end, as it were. Um, so just I wanted to look back for a second, as we usually do, to last week when um, you remember we talked about the, the great story about it's easier for a rich man to pass through it's easier for a, a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And to which Peter responds, you know, look, we've left everything and followed you. You know, what more do you want? Um, does anyone want to comment or is there anything left over from last week's conversation that we need to revisit? It was a good conversation, uh, yep. and I'm grateful for that. Okay, excellent. Just want to make sure we don't have any dangling threads. Well, and then the other thing I wanted to share this morning is this quote from Bonhoeffer. I think you all know Bonhoeffer's story. Um, martyred in April of 1945. Uh, he was a member of the Confessing Church, had come in Germany, a Lutheran pastor, had come over to this country, was teaching at Union Seminary in New York City, and felt as though he needed to go back to Germany, and he lost his life as a result of that. Um, but this is from his uh, seminal book, The Cost of Discipleship. And he writes, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And as we've been talking about in Mark's gospel, you know, the disciples are trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. What does it mean that we've left everything and followed you? And um, we'll talk about that as we finish up Mark 10 today in particular. Uh, the disciples' view of what they should have, what should be coming to them, and what true discipleship looks like, um, at, according to Mark's gospel and according to Jesus' requirement for his followers. So, um, last thing I'll say is that Earlier in uh, Mark 10, Jesus was, it said that he was in Judea and across the Jordan, so down in this area most likely. There's Jericho, this is the Dead Sea, uh, there's the Jordan. And today he's going to begin making his way toward Jerusalem. Um, and I just wanted to share also a photo with you that I took of the, this area uh, three years ago when we were there, just to give a sense of the landscape for those who have not been there. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind as you're thinking about them making their way toward Jerusalem. It's not an easy trajectory at all. All right. And so... Clear <clears throat> Okay, so we also know that thus far Mark's gospel, Jesus has predicted his death and resurrection twice. You remember the first time was at Caesarea Philippi, right after he asks them, after he asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus um, tells him, get behind me, Satan. Um, so this is now the third time that Jesus is going to tell the disciples what is to come. Would somebody like to read? I'm thinking, yeah, if, if we could read these three paragraphs as a unit. I know that's a chunk, but they kind of hang together. That would be great. Would somebody be willing to read those out loud for us? Oh, where do you want to start? Uh, 32. Okay. Do 32 through 45. Okay. Thank you. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. 
We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other at your left in your glory. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. You want to do the next paragraph too? Fred? Oh, sure. Thank you. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. <laughs> Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. Thank you so much. All right, there's a lot there. Where would you like to begin, anybody? What is the difference between those who were following him and, you know, the disciples were astonished and those who followed him were afraid? Yeah, you know, that's interesting because I hadn't even really heard that distinction until you read it. It may be that your translation just brought that out for me. So let's look at the interlinear and see um, if they use if it uses different words. Uh, da, 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 da. So those who follow, it's a root that it's the same root that from which we get acolyte. Acolytes are those who follow behind. Um, Sorry about the pop-up. Um, but what the difference is between... the disciples and those who followed. Unless that simply marks reiteration. You know, it's, it could be for poetic effect. Um, yeah, they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. What do you all think? I would reverse the two. It Said, would seem logical to me that those who followed, you know, the disciples would be afraid and those who followed would be astonished at the miracles hmm. Jesus was working. I mean, I assume followers are less, you know, in the hierarchy are uh, not quite as high up as disciples. Well, that see, that's what I'm not sure about is who exactly is present here, and it's unclear. I think. Does anyone he have other thoughts about that? Because is there you know an outer ring of people following, or is this just the disciples, and is this just Mark yeah. reiteration? That's what I'm not clear. About. That that's what I see it as. They uh, the one and the same group, being <clears throat> following and being afraid. So amazed, and the gospel, amazed and afraid, sorry. Mm. The gospel parallels make it very clear it's the 12. Yeah. And all, all of that is left out and just as Jesus takes, took the 12 aside. I, it may be that the other gospelers decided that was too ambiguous and they wanted to mm. do it up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking to see if Amy Jill Levine says anything. Um, see, I yeah. think she goes, she doesn't specifically say who's traveling with him, but looking at the context. So going back, um, so we had the encounter with the rich man. So certainly as they were traveling, other people came along and approached Jesus. 
but it doesn't mention that there is a crowd that I can see. So it may just be Mark's way of phrasing it, um, as Elin said, the one in the same group. But it is confusing, I think. And again, I hadn't even picked up on that. So, as of, so this is why I love when people use different translations, because it brings out nuances that we don't necessarily notice if we're all looking at the same version. Um, so let's, okay, for the sake of argument, we can say, imagine that it is Jesus and the Twelve walking. Um, they were amazed and they were afraid. What are they afraid of? What's going to happen to Jesus and what's going to happen to them? But that sort of only get, gets expressed later on. <laughs> well, I think as well, this when they were going to Jerusalem, that's sort of where a lot of the anti Jesus movement was centered, where they'd send the scribes out from. It was the temple, and I think they were getting a little nervous uh, about going to Jerusalem. And with good reason. I wonder if maybe it's starting to dawn on them because it, again, we don't know if this is Mark's redaction of the story or if this is the order in which Jesus really said these things. But again, let's just take it at the level of the narrative. So if Jesus has just said, uh, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters, yada, 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 who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age with persecutions. Um, if he had just said that, that would make me afraid too. Uh, like, okay, we're going to Jerusalem. As you go and going, you do go up to Jerusalem. It's a, a windy road, um, you know, with switchbacks. And as you approach Jerusalem, you can see the, the skyline. And of course, at this time, what would be on the outskirts of the city? A wall a wall and outside the wall what would what potentially would someone see um guards soldiers yeah and crosses because that was the place of execution and the reason um for crucifixion and it was at the outskirts of the city as you know basically a warning you come into this town and you screw up this is going to happen to you so i can just very and that was a you know that was the common mode of execution so it wasn't obviously reserved for jesus so i could just imagine you know they're heading up to jerusalem and whether there are crosses literally there at the moment or not they know about this there's you know as John said, you know, this is where the anti-Jesus movement is fomenting. Um, so there's a lot to be afraid of. And they still, you know, who knows? Maybe they're starting to get it. Maybe they still haven't. But there's something about going to Jerusalem about which they have anxiety. That's walking into the lion's den. Amen. Exactly. Regardless of what you, uh, you know, I... I often think Jesus and Socrates had the same experience. Both of them could have gone 10 miles in any direction and said whatever they wanted. No one really would have paid much attention. But here they are, as you say, walking into the thick of things, into the very place of persecution. Okay. And then... So Mark tells us that they're amazed. I wonder what they're amazed about. Um, and then he takes the 12, Jesus takes the 12 aside and tells them again what is going to happen to him. What does this bring up for you all? What thoughts do you have? Um, well, it occurs to me that um, he's speaking in a uh, third person he doesn't say i which is mm -hmm. i don't know that's something to think about and um if i didn't go on with this if i just cut off after they say i want you to do something for me mm -hmm. promise to do something and then i didn't know the rest of it i would think they were going to say don't go 
turn around. But instead, they're worried about their fame after yeah. death. It's so weird. <laughs> I, that's a great way to, to, you know, to contextualize it because you're right. You know, it could be, you know, do us, a, you know, do something for us, Jesus. We love you. We're devoted to you. Don't go there. You know, yeah. you told us what's going to happen. Turn around. Um, but that's not at all what they say. Oh. Oh. Where else have we seen James and John? Mm. Oh, when they were re recruited, so to speak. Yep. yep. So, you know, Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, that set of brothers, mm -hmm. and he calls James and John. Yep. Where else have they been? Oh. Hmm. Well. So James and John, along with Peter, are often referred to as Jesus's inner circle. Like among mm -hmm. the 12, this is his closest group. Um, where did we see that closest group when he took them away? On the, on when he the left mountain. To the mountain? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. when, for the transfiguration. Exactly. Yeah. So James and John have seen the glory that has been revealed in the transfiguration right and so that's got to be in the back of their minds like okay yeah we know all this is going to happen but you know let's not focus on that let's focus on what you showed us up there on the mountain and we want a piece of that that's how i hear this mm -hmm. uh, very human but you're right very weird too um you know, especially given that they have left everything and are following Jesus. And one would hope that somewhere along the way they would start to have some kind of a transformation. Easy for me to say. I wasn't there. I, you know, I have the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. I have the benefit of knowing about the resurrection. They didn't. Um, they were told about it, but they, you know, uh, it hadn't, they had not experienced it. Um, so what do you think about James and John. Let's jump to them. I think this is such a human scene. Um, They're still, you know, have the conventional Jewish view of what the uh, Messiah is going to do. Mm -hmm. There's going to be glory and lands and houses and, you know. Mm. All the goodies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if they felt they are asking to be on the left and the right of Jesus in heaven, they must have anticipated that they were also going to be uh, uh, meet their death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually, they'd probably already outlived the average lifespan. <clears throat> Although if, if it's when he comes again in glory and has dominion over uh. all the kingdom, then being on his right and left would probably be a pretty good deal. That means you okay. have mm -hmm. the tribes or a third of the tribes to, uh, to learn over. Yeah. I, I just got to pass on because it struck me as I read the parallels. Good. Yes, please. And in Matthew, it says the mother of yes, the yes. came up to him. And she asks him, or he asks her, what do you want? And she says, make sure my sons are on your left and right. How, how does that get, what is <laughs> why, Patty? I, 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 Jewish mother is <laughs> really her boys. That's kind of how I read it, exactly. It's just <laughs> fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's, if Matthew is trying to, uh, you know, make James and John not sound quite as bad. <laughs> the mother interjecting. Um, it's so interesting because, you know, James and John are always referred to as the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. Um, but we never hear about Mrs. Zebedee, except in that moment where she comes in, I want you to do this. Um, yeah, I think that's fast. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was thinking about that as Fred was reading. It's like, yeah, I know that. And I thought it was Matthew. I knew that it was either Matthew or Luke brought in Mama. Um, and it makes kind sense. It kind of reminds me of 
the uh, American Caesar biography of MacArthur, where his mother writes the head of the World War I expeditionary force and says it would reflect, she knows he's getting ready to promote some lieutenant colonels to full colonels, and it would reflect well on him, that is the head of the expeditionary force, if her son were among them. <laughs> you gotta love a mother. <laughs> She, she, I, the, the first 300 pages of that book are absolutely excellent. Unfortunately, it's an 800 page book. No, oh, <laughs> no, that's more than I can handle. But I love that picture of, of her advocating for her son. That's awesome. He was well, a dragon. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, you know, we could think about, you know, I realize we're reading Mark and not Matthew, but thinking about, you know, to John's question, thinking about the role of the mother. Um, yeah, you know, she wants to position her boys appropriately. And um, so that's that's fascinating to me. So but who says to somebody, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you? Who the heck are they? Wow, how entitled is that? <laughs> well, you can, in Matthew, you can really see where they get their chutzpah. <laughs> exactly, they come by it naturally. Yes. <laughs> well, although I guess, Patty, they are the inner circle. Mm -hmm. But for Peter, they are, you know, they're the, the ones who yep. will be the logical ones that turn. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly. And Peter has just said, you know, we've left everything and followed you. We've given up every, you know, so hello, you know, don't we deserve something? So I do think that that's right. It's just, it reads as so entitled. Um, they sound like children. They do sound like children. Dad, can I have whatever I want? Yep. Well, and if we think about you know, the, the parable that we all know so well of the, the prodigal son, right? It's the same kind of thing. You know, the, the younger son comes and says, I want my inheritance now. Give it to me. It's like, whoa. Um, it's, you know, not dissimilar, that kind of, uh, that sense of entitlement and wanting, you know, quid pro quo. We have given everything up. You know, we've, we've been with you all this time. Now we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And it's interesting that Jesus says, what is it you want me to do for you? I say it's interesting because earlier in Mark's gospel, you know, they're arguing with, with each other along the way. And Jesus isn't standing right with them, but he knows, you know, he perceives what it is that they're, you know, he perceives that they're arguing. Uh, so we can assume that Jesus has a pretty good idea of what it is that they're going to ask. Um, I think it's a safe assumption. But he makes them name it. What is it that you want me to do for you? And what do you think about his response? You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now, Donna, that's terrible English, right? But oh. <laughs> we get the message. Um, so what, what is Jesus saying there? The end is going to be terrible. The end is going to be terrible. Absolutely. He's also saying this isn't his favor to grant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's going to be, I mean, you know, presumably he would be sitting next to the father on his right hand. So are the, are, you know, is one of them going to sort of wedge himself between Jesus and the father to, uh, to get his place? Uh, elbow himself. I love the visual of that. <laughs> That's great. Right, because we, you know, we proclaim he sits on the right hand of the Father, exactly, that Jesus does. So that suggests, you know, just the, the I'm thinking about with Thanksgiving tomorrow, you know, the place settings, you know, <laughs> who sits where? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's not for Jesus to grant. What is this cup that he is going to drink? The crucifixion. Well, it's the bitter cup. Um, the, you know, the it's, anger. It's the passion that he's going mm -hmm. to, that would take this cup from my hand. I mean, I think it's exactly. all the faith that he's, the faith that he is 
sees for himself. Exactly. If we look ahead um, to chapter 14 in the garden, Jesus says in, in verse 36, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. So in some sense, this is a little bit of a foreshadowing, a preview of coming attractions about this cup. Um, if you're familiar with the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, there's the, the song Gethsemane, I think, is just so powerful. And Jesus is agonizing um, in song. And then he says... I will drink your cup of poison. And that just always goes right through me. And, and I hear that here, that, you know, James and John may be anticipating a banquet with flowing abundant wine, right? You know, the prophet Isaiah talks about, um, you know, this, this banquet, this kingdom, what it, you know, it's, it's just, it's a beautiful, abundant scene. But that's not the reality of it, that it, it's the passion, it's the suffering, it's the cup of poison. Similarly, the bapti to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, good grief, um, you know, what is that baptism? I, my study Bible suggests that it could be the death that he is talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. And even now, as Christians, our baptismal liturgy talks about being baptized into the death of Christ. And that language comes from St. Paul. Um, but And even if we think about baptism as it is meant to be, performed where one is literally pushed under the water and held and then comes up gasping you know again we domesticate it in the episcopal church and in other denominations we're not the only ones you know with just polite little dabs of water in the forehead um, but it's you know that the imagery really is about plunging down into death and then rising to new life but they don't get that and perhaps they can't get it yet Again, it's easy for me to say. I have the benefit of having read the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Exactly. But notice what they say. They say, we are able. We can do this. Well, Mark had the benefit of hindsight also. He wasn't writing it till around the 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But he's writing about... <clears throat> he's telling the story as it unfolded at the time. So the fact that he's, you know, they, the disciples say, we can do this, we're able. It's like, okay. You know, it, it, it's sort of fitting with the portrait of the disciples that's painted in Mark's gospel that, you know, they're always, you know, they think that they know more than they do, which is a dangerous combination. Um, it, it, I'm just remembering that uh, at the baptism um, there was a voice from above that says, you are my son with whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't seem likely that there are going to be uh, lots of sons. He is the, the one. Mm -hmm. And then he says that it's, I can't grant that type of thing, like sitting on the left and the right. Um, but it's for those for whom it's been prepared he seems that he is subservient to God the Father. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, and you absolutely, Donna, and it does echo back to that open because of course in Mark's gospel it begins with John the Baptist. It begins with Jesus coming down to the Jordan. And that moment where, you know, we sort of get the 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 Trinity uh, at a very rudimentary level because we have Jesus, the person, the man. We hear the voice of God the Father and then the dove descends, indicating the Holy Spirit. So that's one of those moments where you get you know, the fullness of the Trinity. And here it's kind of hinted at as well. As you say, it's not explicit, but you know, I'm not, it's not, I can't grant that. You know, that is for the Father 
to grant. Absolutely. Which in Matthew gets added in specifically. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This has been prepared by the Father. Mm. It's just, it's so interesting. And, and I'm really, I've said this before, I'm really glad that you're reading along with the Gospel Parallels, John, because it's, it's because we're pretty sure that Mark's of the four canonical Gospels, uh, Marx was the first to be written. It's just so interesting to see, you know, how the other Gospelers riff, particularly Matthew, because his Gospel is so long and he adds so much detail. Um, and he takes the bare bones of Mark and fills in some gaps. And it's, it's just very interesting to think about why he does that and why Mark might not do that. Anything else about the request itself before we re look at this last paragraph again? Um, I think that they must somehow not be aware because when they say I am able, um, but they've just heard about the flogging and the death. Um, For the third time. Yeah, it just seems <laughs> like they're not getting it somehow. Mm -hmm or else they couldn't speak up so glibly and say, okay, yeah, I can do it. Yep, yep. Alternatively, they've got a very deep commitment to Christ. Mm. I think that that is their intention, for sure, their aspiration. Um, Again, you know, they wouldn't have given up everything and followed along all this time unless there were some, you know, profound affiliation, affection, respect, admiration, worship. Um, and yet, even at that, it's as though they're just seeing the surface and can't understand the fullness of it now we also have to remember that every time jesus turns around in mark's gospel he's always saying you know if someone's healed or there's an exorcism don't tell anybody you know so at some level i want to say jesus what do you expect that they don't get it you know you're kind of sending mixed messages um so there's always this tension because the disciples are supposed to be the ones who understand jesus you know, when he explains the parables, he doesn't explain them to the larger crowd. He explains them to the disciples. They should get it. And yet, even for them, it's difficult. Um, I mean, they but, left everything and followed Jesus. But, you know, according to the narrative, it didn't really, you know, Jesus said, come and they came. They left. Mm -hmm. Not a... Uh, you know, there wasn't time to build a profound commitment. And I'm remembering Jesus's parable of the sower. Mm -hmm. Does Jesus really know that, you know, this has taken deep root and, you know, or are they like ones that hear the word and follow along and then the sun comes up and, and blisters it and they die. That's great, Fred, because remember, we all need to remember that Mark kind of sets that parable up as a framework for interpretation in the gospel. So I'm really glad you went back to that. So no, there isn't in that split second, there isn't time for, you know, a lot of analysis and discernment. However, the fact, you know, they've kind of voted with their feet because they're still with them. You know, they could be like the rich young man who turns around and goes home at some point, but there's got to be something in it for them. Uh, maybe it's a sense of adventure or, you know, they've come this far, they're committed, who knows, but they're still with him. And, you know, we're getting ready, you know, he's on the way to Jerusalem, so we could imagine that it's been three years now-ish. So, you know, they've been at this for a while. Um, but they still don't get it. Yeah, exactly. So, that's, which is, you know, I think that that is a message I take it as a message for myself that you know when I think I get it oh yeah I can do this there's still so much I don't understand and I think that's true for all of us that we might set our hearts upon something and think that we're being faithful and think that we are fully engaged and yet we don't have a clue of what it really means um, and that's just the way it is it's not I don't think that's a judgment per se I think that's that's the reality 
that we can't fully understand. And there is some yeah. arrogance when we think we do, I guess. You can't know you can do something until you've done it. Right, precisely. I was talking to somebody the other day about, you know, some of my bike rides and, mm -hmm. you know, I want to know that I can still go out and do it. But you, if you don't try. But the only wonder. way I can know that is to actually go out and, you know, ride that distance. Then and, I can come back and for a short period of time, I can say, I know I can do it. Yeah. And, and inherent in that is, you know, you're taking a risk because you don't, setting out, you don't know for sure you can do it. And you're willing to, to take that chance of not being able to do it. That's great. Yeah. What interests me here in verse 41, when the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John, which implies to me that Peter is one of those who's angry. Even though he's part of the, the inner circle too, he's now separating himself from James and John. Like, what are you doing? Um, and so Jesus calls them all together. You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. Uh, the tyrants, and you know, we can think of Rome here, but it is not so among you. Or maybe it should really say it should not be so among you, because clearly it is so among <laughs> them. Um, whoever wishes to become great must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first must be slave of all. Um, that's familiar language for us. Thoughts on that or observations or wonderings? Okay, well, let's move on to the last story in chapter 10. And I think we'll stop after that so that we can gather everyone for chapter 11 next week. Um, this, is a, this is a great story. Okay, would somebody read The Healing of Blind Bartimaeus for us? I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, John. Uh, they came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, give up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Thank you, John. So let me just very quickly go back to the map. So they have been here, sort of in the wilderness of Judea, across the Jordan River, and now they're in Jericho, and then from there they will make their way up to Jerusalem. So Jericho is right by the Dead Sea, and it's you know, one of the lowest places on earth, which I just think is helpful to set the site as they are making their way up. Uh, and this is where this story takes place, is along the way. So what do you notice here or wonder about? Well, he wasn't told not to tell anybody. Mm-hmm. True. Mm -hmm. Yep. No. And as we're getting closer to Jerusalem, Jesus does <laughs> that with less frequency. And, you know, now the, the secret's kind of out. Yeah. He also is following him. This would seem to indicate that Jesus had followers who weren't part of, who weren't disciples. Right. So the disciples are really the inner circle. I mean, there's, 
there's a circle and then there's the inner circle of three it, you know, sort of concentric mm -hmm. circles so then there are also these outer rings of followers and that's what your question earlier about you know who was afraid and who was amazed that was why I have such a great question because was that la larger circle there for that or not but we know that the crowd is here now yeah there, I mean he seems to be able to draw a crowd mm-hmm Always and has been. Once again, I would expect the disciples to be afraid and the crowd to be astonished rather than vice versa. Well, he also is being recognized as son of David, yeah. which I think is, you know, Messiah or the, yeah. the anointed one. And that could just, I mean, that could just be a, uh, a bit of flattery. Well, let me read what Amy Jill Levine says. Her comment here is some contemporary Jewish healers healed in the name of Solomon, who was literally the son of David. And he, she cites Josephus there. The son of David healing formula may have influenced the followers of Jesus. Um, and um, yeah, and then she goes on to uh, cite uh other sources but then she says in both matthew and luke joseph is david's descendant but mark lacks a genealogy so um this is i think this is the first time that we hear jesus referred to as son of david in mark i believe so but that so that's the context is that you know healing in the name of solomon um who literally was david's son so that would be a you know a common phrase but he attributes it specifically to Jesus um, many sternly ordered Bartimaeus to be quiet this isn't the first time we've seen you know either the disciples or the crowd you know don't bother him when it you know it's about the children or uh, you know we saw people healing in your name but we stopped them because they weren't following us. Uh, so there's always this in not all, well, there's often this insider outsider language dichotomy here. So people wanting to you know, push Bartimaeus to the margins, just shut up, just be silent. Don't talk. What else do you observe in this story? Uh, the attribution of faith as um, the condition for healing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you all make of that? It has kind of the same flavor as a uh, prophet is without honor in his own land. Can you faith say more is, about that? Well, faith, Jesus is saying faith is required when he heals, mm -hmm. you know, when he brings the little girl back. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, you know, do you believe? If you believe, all is possible. If you're, if you don't believe, you know, there's nothing I can do for you. Mm. <laughs> and to a certain extent, it plays into the same theme as the rich young man. The rich young man had, would have to believe. Mm -hmm. You know, he would have to accept the fact that the way to heaven is to shed your earthly entanglements. So in order to make that kind of transformation, he would have to believe, right? He wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to do that. Well, you wouldn't yeah. do it if you didn't believe. Exactly. So. It'd be, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It seems like there have to be two acts. You can't just say, Jesus, fix me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it takes more than that. You've got to, you mm -hmm. have to have the belief, the faith that it can be done. Beautiful. Do you hear any language here that echoes the previous story about James and John? Oh. Perhaps that they're trying to keep Jesus for themselves. 
being close to him is a perk. <laughs> Definitely. It's like there's literally language that's the same in this paragraph as in the previous paragraph. Does anyone see it? That where he says what you want me to do for you. Yes, exactly. So just as he asks James and John, okay, you know, you've just said you want me to do for you whatever you ask. What is it you ask? And so now he's saying the same to Bartimaeus. You know, Bartimaeus stops him in his tracks. Mark says, Jesus stood still. That always gets my attention because, you know, Mark's language is generally so sparse that when he says something, it's like, what is it, E.F. Hutton? You know, you lean in and you listen. Um, it's kind of like that. You know, Jesus stood still. Like Bartimaeus has the capacity to stop Jesus in his tracks. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, and he stops and he calls him to him. What is it's it? It's really not a very perceptive uh, time for Jesus. If you're stopped by a blind person asking for healing, you okay. know, I mean, what does he expect him to say? Okay, so hold on to that. All right. Why does Jesus ask the question? Does he need to, just as I said before, does he really need to ask James and John what they want? You know, we can assume that he's pretty perceptive, pretty attuned. Does he need to ask this blind man? I'm glad you said that. Does he need to ask Bartimaeus what he wants? I would no. hope not. So why does he ask the question then? Uh, I think to see his state of faith and he becomes, um, he's converted from being a blind beggar at the side of the road to a follower. Ah, beautiful. And it hinges on claiming what he wants, right? You know, Jesus makes him say it. There are other times where Jesus doesn't do that, where he just you know, automatically leans in and, and, and performs the healing. Or there are times when the crowd brings a person to him. But here, he wants the blind man to own it, to name it. You know, like, what do you think I want? I want a million shekels. Of course I want to see. Um, so I'm so glad you said that, Fred, because, you know, I think it's a rhetorical device. You're like, okay, tell me. Oh, well, you could have said, I'd like my family since I can no longer support them to, mm -hmm. you know, to have, to get something. Sure. Absolutely. But I think there's something pivotal in requesting that Bartimaeus name for himself what it is. And I think that's tied into that final sentence, your faith has made you well. Um, that in order to ask the question, he has to believe that Jesus has the capacity to do that. To, to going back to what Donna said about Bartimaeus being converted or you know transformed from a beggar on the side of the road, whom the crowd is trying to silence, you know, verse 50, uh, throwing off his cloak. You know, it's just, again, that's an interesting image. You know, here he is, we can imagine, unfortunately, we have all seen too many times homeless folk down, you know, I was driving through Foggy Bottom the other day and, and the tents are everywhere, right? And people on the side of the road and, you know, with their blankets, with their jackets, with their coats, it's all they have protecting them. And Bartimaeus throws it off, springs up. You know, it's just, it's such a vital image and, and comes to Jesus. So, you know, I, I just think it would, do you, I, you use that word converted, Donna, and I think it's absolutely there in that verse 50. That motion that, okay, I'm, you know, this is all I had, and I'm going to throw it off and put all my eggs in the Jesus basket right now. Is there anything else in that story? It's a short story, but I think, you know, it's, it's dense. And the fact that it's on the way to Jerusalem um, is interesting to me that Jesus stops and has this encounter with him. Yeah. 
and I'll throw out one thing from the parallels in Matthew, it's two blind beggars ah. oh. get healed. Uh, same story, but with two of them. So. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. And we could ask ourselves, why would Matthew double the people? I'm sure that there were plenty of people on the roadside. I'm quite sure. Miracles. Mm. Quite sure. Mm. There were also lots of stories. Mm -hmm. You know, they might have taken a different story and felt like it was more yep. impressive. With two. And, and exactly. Sometimes doubling in the Bible is meant to, you know, literally be an intensification to, you know, as if you were underlining or bolding. Um, you know, the importance of that moment. Yep. Just thought it's interesting in verse 51 where the blind man says, my teacher, the Aramaic Rabboni, that's what Mary Magdalene calls Jesus, the risen Christ in the garden when she encounters him. Remember on Easter morning, Mary Magdalene has come she mistakes Jesus for the gardener. She does not know who he is at first until he speaks her name. He says, Mary. And then she says, Rabboni, my teacher. So I just, I think that that's a lovely um, echo there. Um, you know, because every time Aramaic shows up, I think it's a more intimate dialogue the way jesus calls the father abba you know daddy in aramaic you know that's the common parlance so the fact that that gets inserted there it's just again i don't necessarily think we need to make a whole lot about it but i just think it's a lovely scene between bartimaeus and jesus let me see again and that's the other interesting thing, too. As opposed to the man born blind in John's Gospel, and we talked a lot about him, clearly Bartimaeus used to see, and for whatever reason, he's lost his vision. And now that vision is restored. And I think that there's meant to be some echoing of um, the other blind man, remember, whom Jesus heals. Remember, if Ellie were with us, she would say, well, it didn't quite take the first time. It was one of those two-stage miracles where the man, where Jesus, uh, you know, starts to heal the man, and he says, well, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Um, and then it takes a second time. You know, I think Mark is revisiting that theme of healing of the blind. Although there are marked contrasts with this one, because the first guy was brought to him, didn't ask for anything. Exactly. Uh, it was a demonstration. This is the guy who asked and had faith. Exactly. And that guy, if I remember, he said, don't even go back to the village. Mm -hmm. you know, don't tell anybody. While I think Fred pointed out here, hey, follow me. Yep, exactly. Times have changed. Exactly. Exactly. So what starts out as, you know, the the word is kept, you know, so such a secret, that messianic secret that we talked about at the beginning of Mark's gospel. Gradually, it's revealed more and more the closer we get to the crucifixion, the passion and the crucifixion and resurrection. All right. So just looking back, a lot happened in chapter 10. So we started out with that teaching about divorce we talked about two weeks ago the little children the rich man and then now he has turned and he's on his way from jericho up to jerusalem so next week we begin uh it's the beginning of the end and we still will take six chapters to get to the end um but this is where we turn in luke's gospel uh, to give a little preview of gospel parallels. In Luke's gospel, Luke literally says, it's the midpoint in the gospel, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And you, know, you can sort of imagine him in profile looking up toward Jerusalem. Mark doesn't say it quite that explicitly, but that's essentially what's happened. This is the turning point. So we'll pick up there next week. 
All right, everybody, thank you. As always, a robust discussion, and I look forward to seeing some of you on Sunday, maybe all of you on Sunday, and I'll see you next Wednesday as we do Chapter 11. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving Happy to Patty. everybody. Thanksgiving to you, Patty. Patty. I hope your trip to the Bay is traffic-free tomorrow, John. <laughs> it's aspirational. That's my thought. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.